Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of God. Good to see everybody this morning. You know, God is, uh, God is such an awesome God. Amen. And, uh, you know, when you, when you allow him in your heart, you know, my whole thinking has changed. I mean, everything changes. You know, of course, the word of God restores our minds and, and renews our thinking. But I look at life all, it's all different now. Amen. I mean, all kinds of life. And I remember that right after I got saved, you know, looking out the front window and my lawn was uh, so green. And I used to hate to cut the grass. I mean, I didn't care about the grass. And I'm thinking, it's so green, and it's my yard. It's beautiful. You know, I mean, it sounds, it sounds crazy, but that's just what the Lord does. You know, you, you just look at things so totally different, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he does that. Amen? Amen. He puts a new song in your heart. You know, you sing, you sing differently. You, th- you start thinking differently about a lot of things. And you have a more appreciation of life and, and the things that people go through. And, and, uh, and so I'm thankful this morning. Anybody in here thankful? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And you know, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us, it tells us that, the, that uh, praise, that's what praise is. It's a thankfulness. Amen. And it, and it spills out. If you got it in your heart, it'll spill out across your lips. And so, you know, I'm I'm thankful that this Lord's Day that we can come together and we can show our appreciation to God. Amen. Amen. You know, I've uh, I've did uh, five funerals in the last two weeks and uh, just being with families and and talking to them. And, you know, there's a lot of sadness, but several of them were ready to go, you know, and so you celebrate with them, you know, but but there still is a sadness weeping. A uh, man endure for the night, but joy shall come in the morning. Amen. And so, you know, uh, I think when you go through something like that, you know, losing the loved one and everything, it should give us a, more of an appreciation for life. Amen. And an appreciation for uh, f- friendships and relationships because, you know, in Peter it says that this life is but a vapor. It's only going to last a little while. And so then you, you make every every day count amen and this is a special day amen it's the lord's day amen. that we come together to show him our appreciation for just getting us stopped and uh, getting us off that highway to hell amen? amen and putting us on the highway to heaven let's pray this morning father we just love you so much father god and we're thankful Lord, that you've came into our lives, that you got us stopped, Father God. You, you spoke to us, Lord. You gave us, a, you gave us a clarity of mind for, that, for, a, for a moment there, Lord God, that we could think straight, Lord God, that we could get our, our uh, head on straight, Father God, to know that, that it was you speaking to us. And Lord God, you were, uh, you were drawing us, Father God, and we're thankful, Lord God. We are thankful people this morning, and Lord, we're just, we have come together on this special day, Lord God, putting you in remembrance of all that you've done, Father God, being thankful, Lord God, how you continue. You're not done yet, Lord God. We know that. You've got so much more in store for us. You're a God that does exceedingly and abundantly much more than we could ever hope, ask, or think. And Father God, so we thank you this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. First Peter 2 and 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Amen. A holy nation. You are a peculiar people. Yeah. Amen. Turn to your neighbor so you're peculiar. Yeah. And so should we be. That means that we're different from the world. Amen. We're different from the rest of the world because he made us different. Because we were called out of darkness. Amen. To show forth his praises to the one who's called us out. Amen. And now we're a part of the kingdom of light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Jesus preach you would be here on a Sunday morning instead of sleeping in. Amen. Ain't God good. Amen. You know, I'm thankful this morning that God is so faithful to us. He is so committed to us to finish what he started amen Amen. he's consistent amen hallelujah and one thing about it 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Amen.
Don't you feel the love here this morning? God's love. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I love John 1 and 12 where it says, To those who have received him, to have believed on his name, to them he's given power to become the sons of God. Amen? Sons and daughters of God, if you will. Amen. Just because it says sons, that means male and female. Amen. So we're sons of God. Amen. Children of the king. King's kids. Hallelujah. And that's important to know in this life. If we're to have life and to live life and have it more abundantly, it's, it's, uh, it's important that we know who we are. Because, see, that's the very thing that the enemy wants to chisel you out of. Amen. He don't want you to believe that. Right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, when Jesus ascended on out of here, he says, I'm not going to leave you orphanless. Thank you, you know, Lord. I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm not going to leave you defenseless. Amen. I'm going to send you another comforter. Amen. Hallelujah.
you, Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, you're special because God says you are. And you can't go against the word of God. Eh? Try, amen. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes we think that we know better, but we don't. Amen. And there's a way that seems right unto man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death, right? Amen. It's not in man to direct his own footsteps. But as we acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways, he will direct our footsteps. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we've come to worship you this morning, oh God.
That's the yes, cry Lord. of the church. Hallelujah. Come, Hallelujah. even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, come, Jesus. come, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you said that, do you believe he came? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. I believe he came. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I believe that right now he's ready just to receive whatever it is that you have. So I just encourage you just to just shut your eyes just a moment, right, and just unload right just let him know lord god this is what's heavy on my heart lord jesus i'm so thankful that you came i'm so thankful that you're here i'm so thankful that you're just that you're ready to receive my praise but you're also ready to receive me saying you know what dad it's been hard this has been a tough week i've been really struggling in this area or i'm afraid of this or i got a bad report and i really don't know what to do i know what i should do but i'm having a hard time doing that and lord i need your help i need your assistance and i'm calling upon your name yes, i'm lord. inquiring yes, of lord. you lord i'm asking you lord give me wisdom give me understanding lord god help me to know what I'm supposed to do. Lord, I'm acknowledging you right now, and I'm asking you to order my footstep. Show me what the next thing that I need to do is. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's just praise him. Thank him. Right? If you said something to him like that, if you asked him for help, Amen. How many know he's not somebody to play games with you? He's not deaf. He's not That's wanting right. you to Amen. speak up a little bit louder. Amen. He was just needing you to enact your will. He was just needing you to ask him. We have not because we ask not, right? We, 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 we feel like, well, God knows and he should just do something about it. He wants to do something about it. But he will not overpower your will. Amen. You invite him in. You say like the song said, come, come, Lord Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he says. If you'll open the door, I'll come in. Let's thank him. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you that you've heard our request. We thank you that you've heard our cry, Lord God. And Father, we know that there is nothing impossible to you. And there is nothing impossible to us when we're putting our trust and our confidence in you. Lord, we quiet our minds right now. I just come against that, that confusion and that agitation and that stirring, whatever. If you're feeling stirred right now, it's like you can't hardly keep one thought. I just... Uh, I bind that, and if you want that gone, you just say, I want it gone. I agree, I want it gone right now in Jesus' name. I want a stillness and a peace to come to my spirit right now in the name of Jesus. I've come to worship God. I've come to be in his presence, and the devil's not going to steal what I've come here for. He's not going to take it away from me because he's stirring me up. I declare that I'm at rest. I declare that I'm at peace. 
right now I'm open I'm ready to receive I'm an empty vessel that the Lord can just pour into and I declare it and I thank you Lord I thank you that you're gonna fill me during this service when I walk out of this building I will not be like I came in you'll fill me in Jesus name thank you, Lord. hallelujah thank you Jesus God's good let's give him a round of applause Hallelujah, he's worthy. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you for reverencing the Lord. Hallelujah. I mean, we don't mess around. I mean, we came and sang. We worshiped him. He shows up over our praises. He shows up in our thanksgiving, right? He ushers us in to his presence. That's an absolute, absolute fact. We want to welcome all of our first-time visitors, if this is your first time here at the Ellettsville House of Prayer, we'd like to recognize you if you'd raise your hand up real high. Our ushers have a special gift. All right, I see those hands. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. Amen. We're glad that you came out to be with us this morning. And we want to welcome everybody on Facebook Live right there. We're glad that you're there. And uh, you can tell us down in the comments, this is my first time tuning in to the Ellettsville House of Prayer. And everybody uh, that's watching there, I encourage you to click that share button down below the screen there so that you can invite all of your friend list, right? All your friends and all your enemies, all those folks on. And those stalkers that stalk you on Facebook, hey amen, you can give them a little bit of Jesus this morning by just hitting that share button. Hallelujah. And uh, if you've got a need, if you need a prayer need, we encourage you to type it down there uh, in the, the box below, the comment box, right? And uh, we pray, but God sees you. It's just like you making a prayer request. You're making your request known unto God, and we encourage you to do that this morning. Praise the Lord. Looks like we've got something going on. Oh, just to watch announcements. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to have some announcements. Come on down. Come on up. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you get those lights for me? No. You can't do it today. <clears throat> Go sit with the children. I'm joking. Well, this is why. This is why. There should be sound. Hold on, we're going to have to pause and restart for technical difficulties. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's on PowerPoint. It's on computer, Pastor Tony. Still no sound. All right, guys, we're going to give them a minute to work that out. I don't know why there is no sound, so you guys just be patient. Our lovely uh, Wranglers made a movie on the book of Daniel, so do you want to help with announcements? He was down there taking nap time waiting for crackers. I know it. Good morning. Good morning. So we've got, okay, we've got the hog roast coming up October 3rd, October 3rd is the day it starts at 9 a.m. and then it goes until we get done, so come out to, to the uh, prayer breakfast starting at 9 a.m. and then we got cornhole toss tournament, free beans and cornbread. A pie eating contest and a motor motorcycle rodeo games. 
There's also free food, so. Woo. Camping is available during the hog roast down in the town of Deliverance. So come out Friday night and hang out, camp, do the uh, singing and pie and whatever around the fire and all that jazz. Saturday, October 3rd, 9 a.m., free prayer breakfast. All are welcome. 1 p.m. starts the motorcycle rodeo games. Then the fundraiser for the booth rental at the Motorcycle Expo. So the participants in the rodeo, it's a $10 a head fee. Uh, it's free to the public. Come view. 1 to 3 p.m. will be the kids' games as well, including the pie-eating contest. So bring your bellies and... It, Fill them full of uh, pie pudding, I think it is. And then uh, cornhole toss tournament at 3, free beans and cornbread at 4 o'clock, ice cream, desserts, drinks, and the hog roast. And 6 p.m. we'll wrap up with the hay rides. So it's a day full of fun. <laughs> Exciting. The prayer breakfast is, uh, again, Saturday, October 3rd at 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon. Come out. We got prayers, pray, praise, prayers, food, and fellowship. No reservations needed. Breakfast is free. So come out and get some. Features Pastor Larry here playing the guitar. And then Rev. Natasha Howard presenting the word. And Brenda Tabor giving her testimony. So come out to the breakfast and check them out and eat the food. Now, the Unchained Ministries annual benefit bake sale and auction. That's Friday, October 30th at 6 p.m. It's right here at the House of Prayer. Uh, donations accepted. Do not donate clothes, but wear clothes to the annual benefit bake sale auction. Everyone is welcome. Sorry for any confusion, so don't show up naked. You'll still be kicked out. Monday night Bible study, 7 p.m., Funny looking, ain't Sorry. Wednesday night Bible study, midweek refuel, 7 p.m. Who We Are in Christ Bible study, Saturday at 3 p.m. with Ms. Bonita. Sunday morning service, 10 a.m. You're here for it, so. Ready to try it? All right, let's give her, let's, let's, let's give her a try right now. It'll be good, I promise. It's crazy, crazy good. Uh, dismiss the teens, you guys are out of here. That means you, Kaylee. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. We got a lot of good things coming up this weekend. Hopefully, yeah. you've gotten it on your calendar. Uh, we want to encourage those that are going to come out and camp with us. Come and camp. It's going to be beautiful camping weather, right? In the 60s to 70s during the day and down to 40 at night, which that's good. What? That is awesome sleeping weather. Yes, sir. Amen. So, plan accordingly. Uh, there is the breakfast and the lunch and the hog roast and all that, but all your other meals is uh, your responsibility So, and camping gear. But please come out and be a part of that with us, and we're going to have a good time. And Stacia has a quick announcement for Kids Church. Okay, I just have a few names for you. See if you recognize any of these names. Fred and Betty Taylor. Uh, Ruth Moore, um, Larry Webb, um, Steve Nance, Rex and Becky Robinson. Anybody know any of those people? Uh -huh. You know Larry Webb, don't you? Larry yeah. Webb. Larry Webb was my junior high Sunday school teacher, and all those other people were the people who taught kids' church or Sunday school when I was growing up. Changed my life, right? I mean, I grew up in a Christian home, but having those faithful people in my life all the time uh, made a difference. That's where I met Jesus. That's where I learned to uh, 
uh, believe that miracles are still happening today. Right. That's where I learned to give and to serve. And uh, I will tell you that not all those people were, uh, some of them were kind of odd. I'll just say it. Um, and they didn't know everything. And it wasn't always the big dramatic moments that I remember. I remember their faithfulness more than anything. I remember that every time I went, they were there. It was a big deal. Changed my life. Formed my life. All right, here's some more names for you. See if you know any of these names. Angel Scroggins, Michael Parrott, Sherry Critchfield, uh, Meg Eck. You know those names? Yeah. Uh, Terry Abrams. Yeah, when I came to this church, I was that lady with all the kids. Yeah, some, some people called me, you know, said I must live in the old shoe because I had so many kids that didn't know what to do. Yeah. And, we, and we sat on what I call the fire aisle there. And it's like bringing puppies to church when you have four kids under the age of six. Um, so those people I just mentioned, Natalie uh, Miller, uh, those people that I just mentioned are the ones that I remember vividly in those first few months of being here when nobody knew who I was except the lady with all those kids. Uh, he ended up having to travel for work for four months or five during those first, I don't know, seven or eight months that we started coming to church, so I was alone with the four. Anyway, all that to say, those people I mentioned, among others, one, were the ones who took time to reach out to my kids. So they may not have even, it wasn't so much what they did for me, it's that seeing somebody admire my kids, check on my kids. Two of the people I mentioned, Natalie and Michael, were teenagers at the time. I couldn't take my son Reese down to, uh, I think it was called Spiritual Sprouts or something, that toddler class, unless Michael Parrott was there. <laughs> he, he wouldn't stay if Michael wasn't there. And Natalie uh, would, like at the Holy Ghost Hog Rose, we, we had just been here like two weeks when we went to that. Um, she came over and said, I'll watch the kids while you go get your plate and stuff. And she just came and assisted and, and, you know, whatever she could do. She was just a teenager. Meg Eck was just kind of like, give me that baby, and would uh, hold Hagen while I wrangled the others. So all that to say that at that time, that was a ministry to me. Because anyone who served my kids served me. Yeah. All that to say that you have something to give to the young families of the church, to the kids of the church, and to the parents of those kids. And we need you to offer that, uh, that gift. So in kids' church ministries, all the ministries zero on up, uh, we need some help, and we need what you have to offer. Uh, we're, uh, we have not had a full kids program on Wednesday, but I think looking for the nursery people think we're going to be able to offer nursery all the way up on Wednesday now so if that has kept you from coming on Wednesday we're going to have something in place for kids from zero all the way up um, you may be thinking I don't want to serve in kids ministries because I don't I'm afraid that I don't know enough of the Bible or something like that we need people to help in lots of areas like uh I would love it if we had a whole team of smiling faces that greeted the children as they came in and pointed the families which way to go. That doesn't take anything except a smile. Um, and then I'd like, you know, if you can support the teacher, if you can teach, if you can do an object lesson, if you can help with the refreshments or the games, something like that. But if you feel like, yeah, yeah, that's something I have then we want you to do that. We want you to serve in that way. And so it's just as simple as letting Pastor Mike or me know that you are willing to give what you have because that's what ministry is. It's giving what you have to somebody who needs it to the glory of Jesus. That's it. Not asking for something you don't have. That's it. All right. What about All right, and we will be having Kids Church on Wednesday night as well. So Good. nursery and Kids Church on Wednesday night uh, where the kids' uh, stars will be meeting downstairs, but the kids will 
Otherwise, we'll be over in Kids Church, and we're going to have a wonderful program. So uh, if you've got kids that would like to be a part of that, come. And if you would like to be a part of that, come. And I'm re- I would extend that appeal that Stacia is making uh, to you folks that have been here for quite a while, right? Children's ministry isn't for the people that have started coming to church for two weeks, and now we need to stick them into children's ministry, right? Uh, we need you folks that have been around a while, right. right? That have been here at House of Prayer a while, that do know the word, and uh, we need you to help out. And uh, many hands make light work, right? Uh, so don't wait for us to come ask you. If the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart. Please come and ask us. Praise the Lord, brother. Do you have a? Hey, good morning. Good morning. I'm going to touch on a subject just for a minute that really isn't talked about in church. And um, there's a couple that I know. Uh, they were raised in the church. Uh, the wife was raised, you know, Pentecostal. Um, the young man uh, raised in a church that I went to. Uh, went to the army. Um, I recently had talked to them uh, over this past 4th of July. Beautiful kids. Every, everything seemed perfect. Well, um, about a week ago, um, a friend of mine gives me a text, and let me pull it up here. I read... Uh, Bloomington police initiated an investigation into a couple after receiving a cyber tip from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children regarding pornographic Snapchat photos. The images depicted uh, children and reportedly were transmitted from this person's uh, internet account. The Bloomington couple remains in jail after being arrested Friday on suspicious of child molesting. On Monday, each was charged in our county for four counts of child molestation, two counts of child exploitation. I don't say that to throw them under the bus, but pornography, I believe, is more addicting than any drug. Because, you know, with men, pornography, she will give you anything you want, any time of the day, and she will always be a 10, no matter what. Especially with Christian men, with this couple, sin is going to find you out, no matter what. We can come into church, we can put on the face We can go home, we can praise, but especially for men, what are we doing behind closed doors? Because this is accessible 24-7s. Your wives have had, doesn't know. You could do anything at any given time. When, back in the Old Testament, when the priest would go in the tent and, you know, give his alms before God and all, and they would tie a rope around his waist, and if he wasn't right... He'd have to be dragged out because he was dead. Well, I say this in kind of in, in a funny matter, but it's serious. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Just think if we were under those standards, how many men or Christian men would walk into church with one hand? You know what I'm saying? I just implore you, If anybody, yourselves, or you know anybody that's dealing with pornography, you need to nip it in the butt. Hell is forever. All the attributes that Jesus is, nothing is there in hell. Psalms 91, I believe, isn't just for your physical protection, but your spiritual protection if there's a husband and wife for your protection. I can admit, I dealt with pornography my whole life, and it, it played a part with uh, getting divorced. Um, 
I remember when I was married, and this is a little tip that I would pray that a husband and wife would do, because this worked when my marriage was right with God. Before we went to bed, we would pray together. And for a better lack of words, it's like the horny Holy Ghost hit me to where I couldn't wait to stop to pr praying to be able to make love to my wife in a pure way. And it was real. Men are visual creatures. They are. You know, going through Bloomington, going down 3rd Street, through campus, that's hard. Men see visual things. And I urge you, especially couples, to pray together, to lift each other up, because this is a disease. You're seeing in the papers and on the news, kids are being sold as sex slaves. It's more prominent now than ever before. I hear the statistics in Christian men, pornography is with them, you know? And it doesn't matter who you are. It took out Jimmy Swagger. It took out that uh, ne uh, Nebstein out in California. It's taken out a friend that I knew in a Christian biker club. He got involved with a young girl, and physically he's not with us anymore. And this is horrible. So I just urge you, especially for single guys, draw close to Jesus. And if, if the pornography plays any part in your life, get rid of it. But for husband and wives, love on each other. Because there's a true love that Jesus can give you for your wife. You know, I've heard pe preachers say, you know, stuff's going to sag. We're not going to look the same. But the true love that Jesus can give us for husband and wife is real. So I, I just want to encourage you just to get rid of it. Thank you. Praise the Lord. All right. Do we have a birthday? Yes. Oh, today's birthdays. <laughs> I just saw the one on there. All right. We want to celebrate your birthday this morning. Hallelujah. If you got a birthday in the month of September, come on down. We're going to celebrate it. Still coming. Hallelujah. You got to tell us your name, how old you are, and when your birthday is. Name's Richard Harris. I'm uh, 67 years old and Woo! September 23rd. <laughs> Justin, nine on the 34th. I'm Keith. I was nine. 38. Nine. 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 Oh, 39. 39. <laughs> I'm 38 on the 15th. All right. Keith. I'm Darlene. Uh, I was 61 on the 18th. I'm Trisha, and I turned 38 on the 12th. I'm Tammy, and I turned 63 on the 20th. And don't tell anybody, but Jeanette and I are the same age. And today's her birthday. I'm Mary. In September 10th, I turned 78. I'm Sue Pierce, and on September 26th, I turned 78. Hi, I'm Joanne, and I turned 72 on September the 10th. I'm Frank, and I turned 60 on the 4th. I'm Tammy, and I turned 52 on the 12th. I'm Denise, and I turned 59 on the 25th. Okay. This is Bristol. She turned 
How old did you turn? Seven. Seven <laughs> on the 19th. And Geneva turned seven. When was your birthday? September the 20. Wait, September the 13th. The 13th. <laughs> well, for most of you, I don't know if you remember us, but Miss Destiny here just turned it's one on yeah. September 7th. Hey! Hey! I'm Kathy, and I turned 66 on September 3rd. Hey! All right. Hey, we got a big happy birthday that goes out to Pastor Jeanette. Yay! Yay. It's everybody wave. She's watching. All right. And I think there's another birthday. She went ran towards the back, Natalie Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, we gave you up. You're not out here to tell us how old you are, so I guess you're about, what, 75 now? Wow. No, she's in her 40, 40s, probably. 46. I'm just taking a guess. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Uh, happy birthday to you. A happy birthday. You're celebrating an anniversary in the month of September. Come on down. It can be a wedding anniversary. It can be a spiritual anniversary. Whatever you are memorializing in the month of September, come on down. Tell us about it. And two, I went into an operating room after I had two doctors tell me I had cancer. I woke up two hours later in recovery room. I had no cancer. <laughs> and it was because of the grace of God, because I had a praying mother, and because God has had plans for me. Yeah. And nobody else was going to come up here, and I wanted to make sure our Lord got some glory today <laughs> because I got my miracle, and if you're praying for your miracles, believe me, he will give them to you. Just keep on praying. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. A happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. I want to give God a little bit of praise. Uh, amen. It was 19 years ago this week, this Sunday. If not, it was last Sunday, but uh, that we walked through those doors 19 years ago. So God is good. Thank you, Jesus. All right. We're going to continue our worship with our giving, right? We've brought the tithe. We have an offering to give. If you will prepare yourself, uh, we're going to do that. If you're giving online or you would like to give electronically, you can text the amount that you would like to give to 84321. Right? You put that in the address line, 84321. Text the dollar amount, and it'll take it from there. If you've done that before, it's automatic almost. You just put the amount in and it'll do it. You can also go on the website or you can use the church center app as well. Praise the Lord. If you have your tithe, your offering in your hand, if you hold it up to the Lord, <laughs> declare with me 
Luke 6.38 tells us to give, give, and it shall be given unto you. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Good measure. Pressed down. Pressed down. Shaken together. Shaken together. And running over. And running over. Shall men give, shall men give unto, your bosom. unto your bosom. For with the same measure, with the same measure that, you give, that you give, it shall be given unto you again. It shall be given unto you Amen. Again. Do you believe it? Yes. Give us unto the Lord this morning. This is how I find my and bless these tithe and offerings. Yes. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to receive a word from the living God? Amen. We've got Sister Karen Freeman who has prepared herself this morning to give you the word that God has placed on her heart. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. You know, the word of God is so amazing. And no matter how long you've been serving God, does this sound okay? It sounds really echoey to me. Is it okay? Yeah? It, huh? Does have an echo? Maybe it's my big mouth. I have been told, Fred has told me, I always know where you are in the store because I can hear you laughing. <laughs> Somebody I worked with one time said, you laugh like a hyena. Didn't bother me a bit. I just kept on laughing. Anyway. The Word of God is so amazing because no matter how much you study it, how long you've been in this, you will always find some little something that you didn't see before. Uh, I got saved in 1974, and I can't tell you how many times I've read and read and read, and yet I saw something in preparing for this lesson that I had not noticed before. And that just is, is exciting to me because, you know, you think, well... You know, I know this and I know that. but So I'm just going to share that with you. It's not my message, but it, it was exciting to me, so I'm going to share it with you real quickly. It, while I was studying in Leviticus 16, it says, Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Az Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be pre presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. And then if you skip over to 21, see, I didn't know this. I, I had 
I didn't know this. So I was like, wow, there's something else I, there's so much I don't know. <laughs> but I was like, that's amazing. In 21, it says, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. I never knew there was the second goat. I, d I didn't know that. So it was exciting to me to, you know, you just never know what you're going to find in the Word of God. When you study and when you prepare for something else, you find out something totally different. So that was exciting to me. Anyway. <laughs> um, let's pray quickly. Father, I ask that this word go straight to the heart. As I aim my bow, I pray that that arrow goes straight where it needs to go and meets the need that you know it needs to meet. It's not what I say. It's your word that does the work. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 this morning. Let me get there. But I'm going to start reading a little bit ahead of that. I'm going to start at verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swore, swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the holy place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When we're going to be looking at three things today, we're going to be looking at hope, anchors, and high priests. Now, hope, the word hope uh, in archaic language was a fancy word for old, for the old language. Hope has, has a little different meaning than it does today. So when we hope in something, we trust in it. Now, today we think of wishful thinking. You know, if we hope, it's because we, we have this wishful thinking. But that really isn't the meaning of the word hope. In fact, synonyms for the word hope are promising, assured, confident, reassuring, and positive. And the Hebrew and Greek equivalent to that word hope is a meaning of strong and confident expectation. So again, that's very different than today when we say, well, I hope I get to do that. You know you're not going to get to do it. But in, in these days, to say hope meant to trust to expect. You had a confidence that that's what was going to happen. And so we read here that this hope, that we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place behind the curtain. He tells us that we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So what has, sin, what has been set before us? The word of God. The word of God is our hope and everything that lies within it. That's salvation. That's heaven. That's the promise of answered prayer. That's uh, asking you shall receive. That's with all with men things are impossible, with, but with God it's possible. It's everything contained in the word of God is our hope. That is what has been set before us. That's what we strive for. It's what we expect. It's what we have confidence in is this hope. So now we're going to look at the next thing, and that's a boat anchor. And if you'll put that up for me. I looked up anchors. You should look these things up once in a while. It's amazing what you learn. I don't own a boat, so I know nothing about boat anchors. Okay? 
don't know anything about them. But as I begin to study about boat anchors, um, there's different kinds there, and they all have kind of a different purpose. They all depends on the size of your boat, depends on the kind of uh, floor of whatever water you're in, whether it's sandy or muddy or rocky. Uh, I mean, you, anybody in here have boats? So you know all about anchors, don't you? And so some of these, most of them, other than the mushroom, you can't, can't see it very well. The very center one is called a mushroom. Uh, it has holes in it that sand would come up through those holes and then it would go around the, the little lip there and that's what would help weight it down. And I learned that those are good for small boats. You don't use those for a big boat because it, it won't hold very much. But these others all have like um, claws that really dig in and, and they will set you wherever you're at. So we're going to talk a little bit about an anchor. And now that, I mean, you know, you know what an anchor is, and this was just some examples of what they look like. This, this one at the top folds flat so it stores easier. See, see what I've learned? <laughs> and, of course, that one they call the plow. It looks like a plow. One's a navy. You can't read them very well, but anyway. So a, an anchor, as you know, is what keeps a boat in one place, right? That's not hard to figure out. But I want to look a little deeper at an anchor and how it operates. First of all, an anchor is going to keep this boat. I want you to think about this hope, this expectation that we have, this anchor, the word of God that says, as anchored our hope, okay, keeps us from crashing into the shore. If the waters are rough, it's the anchor that you have set that's going to keep you from crashing into the shore. You're still going to have a rough ride. It's still going to be wavy, but you're only going to go so far. And sometimes you may get jerked and knocked down a little bit because that boat's going to go, and then that anchor's going to stop, and you're going to stop. You know, they say it's not the fall that kills you, it's the stop at the end. It's the same with the anchor. You know, that, that boat's going to go, and, but when it stops and it jerks you, you may get knocked down, but you're not going to crash into the waves. You're not going to crash into the shore. An anchor's also good in calm water. Because if you don't anchor your boat, if you don't anchor this hope that you have, this promise set before you, you can often just drift. So anchors aren't just for the rough water. Anchors are for the smooth water. Because before you know it, you're talking, you're doing whatever, and you are drifting out. And so, then you wake up, come to yourself, and you find out you're out in such deep water. No shore in sight because you didn't set your anchor. He said, I didn't need to. You need to always set your anchor. I learned as I looked up anchors that you should always set your anchor when it's calm, not in the middle of a storm. And if you think about our lives, when do we often run to Christ? In the middle of the storm, don't we? And if we'll set our anchor when it's smooth, if we'll set our anchor when it's calm and things are good, We'll be ready when the storm comes. This anchor that we have, you've got to set it before the storm comes. This anchor has to have time to, to dig down in and get into the dirt that's going to hold you. Otherwise, it's just going to trail along the bottom. I mean, it'll slow you down, but if the wind gets very big, you need those claws to dig in, and it needs to set a little more in the smooth water than it does. This hope... And this anchor that we have grounds us in the middle of the storm. It's going to keep us close. It's going to keep us away from the dangerous rocks. It's going to keep us there. Then we're going to look at the high priest. Now, the high priest doesn't mean a whole lot to us, does it? We've never had a high priest. We've never needed a high priest. And when you read this, you often think, well, I don't know what the big deal. They spend a lot of time in Hebrews the writer does, and we're not sure who that writer is. But starting in Hebrews 4, going through chapter 10, they talk about the high priest. And the reason they did that, according to scholars, is because the Jewish Christians were beginning to wonder, did, it, did we make the right decision here? <laughs> now, if you think about the early church, this is all they knew for centuries was a high priest. They had to have this person who could go intercede on their behalf into the Holy of Holies for these two goats. One was offered and their sacrifice, the blood sprinkled on the altar, and the other one prayed over and the sins set out into the wilderness. This was done on the Day of Atonement. 
That was all they knew. All those early Christians knew were sacrifices, traditions, rituals. If you read Leviticus, it's probably no wonder that caught me by surprise because I don't really read in Leviticus a lot. It's kind of heavy reading. But this was all the Jewish people knew. And then they see Jesus come, and he's presenting a whole new way of life to them. And that those that accepted Christ had begun to wonder, did we do the right thing here? Because this is what we've always done, and now you're telling us there's a new way to go, there's a different way, there's a new covenant. You, you say you're the son of God? Now, wait a minute. Ugh. Just think about it today. This is all we know, right? Jesus is all we know. And if somebody comes along and wants to totally change that, we would be a little skeptical. They accused him of blasphemy for claiming to be the son of God, um, they did not always readily accept that. The early church was persecuted for being a Christian. This was all new, and these people were beginning to wonder, did we do the right thing? This hasn't turned out quite like we thought. So the writer begins to talk about being the comparison between the high priest and Christ to assure them that this hope they have, this hope that they have anchored in is the right thing, that they're okay they can count on this. They can trust this. They can believe in this. The high priest, he was, he was the highest order of priest in the Jewish culture. And it was his unique job or privilege to go on the Day of Atonement to represent the people behind the holy, in the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain, to sacrifice for their sins. And we read in Matthew 26, it was Caiaphas, the high priest at that time, and he asked Jesus, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And when Jesus said, I am, he tore his robe. He was angry, and he accused him of blasphemy. And that was the start of the trial and the persecution of Jesus. This was not easily accepted among people because they'd never known anything else. It went against everything they knew. They begin to, in Hebrews, they begin to show some comparisons between Jesus and the high priest. The high priest was the teacher of the law. Jesus was the teacher of the law. On the Sermon on the Mount, he taught the great commandment. The high priest would bless people in the name of the Lord. In, in John 16 and 17, Jesus prays blessings over the people. The priest, the high priest in, in uh, Israel's time was chosen of God. You, you were born into the Le tribe of the Levites and you were appointed and it was a lifetime appointment. And in Hebrews 5.10, Jesus is called of God a high priest. The high priest was a mediator between man and God. And in 1 Timothy 2 and 5, we read that there is one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus as our high priest. The priest had a lifetime office. In Hebrews 7, 21 and 25, he talks about Jesus is our high priest forever. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. The temple had an outer court anybody could be in. And then it had the next court and only certain people were allowed there. And then it had the, an inner court and then the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go. And first he had to cleanse himself. And as our friend mentioned earlier, yeah, if they weren't right, they had bells on the bottom of their robes. And if the bells stopped, they'd drag them out. God said, you weren't clean enough. I would not want to have been the high priest, okay? So you, that's your, it's your week. <laughs> it's your week to do that. But only he could enter the Holy of Holies. And in Hebrews 10, 19, and 20, that the saints enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. So they were convincing these people, these early Christians, that it, Jesus is our high priest now. You, you were right to leave that old covenant, and you're okay to be in this new covenant. When we look at the Bible, we have to remember who it's being written to and the time it was being written. We don't, we don't know anything about a high priest, but we can read about the high priest, and we can understand the comparisons that were made in Hebrews to the high priest and compare it to today. It's still relevant to us today, this hope that we have, this anchor that holds us there, because Jesus, our high priest, has met every requirement. 
He not only he met the requirement of the law, and he met, meets the requirement for the new covenant. Got to get a drink. So we have this hope, this trust, this word of God, this powerful promises, and we have confidence in those, and we are anchored, we are held tight by this hope because Jesus has went in to the Holy of Holies, become our high priest, and taken the place of the high priest that used to work in Israel. And when I look at this thing about the goats that I read earlier, you know, Jesus did it all. He became the high priest. He went in. He was also the sacrifice. And he also carried our sins away, says they're as far as the east is from the west now. He was everything that they needed. And these people needed to understand that. As you think about this great hope that we have, I think there's one thing that detours us, that stops us from hanging on to this hope, that stops us from anchoring in that hope, and I want to touch on that just a little bit. For me, I believe the greatest enemy of the Christian today is what you think of yourself. We are raised to believe that you must be good. From a child, we hear, if you're good, we'll go do this. If you're not good, we're not going to get to go do that. If you're good, Santa will come. If you're good, you know, you'll get this. And we hear that, maybe not in those words, as we grow up into adulthood. If you really look at your life, you'll hear, if your credit score is good enough, you can you'll loan you money to buy a house or get a car. If your SAT score is good enough, you'll get into the, a college maybe you want in. We are trained from early on to believe if we are good enough, things will happen. And good has absolutely no plan in God's, it's no place in God's plan. What you do has absolutely no bearing on the hope that is anchored for you. It has nothing to do with it. I want to read you. Well, I'm, Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And then I want to go to Psalms 139. And I want you to think about this hope. I want you to think about what God has anchored and where, you, where your role is in this. I think you'll be surprised how little role you play. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Go to verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. That's pretty deep. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. In his book was written every day that was formed for me. When as yet there was none of them, before I even had days. I, that's, a, that's really deep for me. <laughs> How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. 
If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. When you begin to think, boy, I've messed that up. This hope is not for me. <laughs> My anchor's not holding very well. I want you to understand that God knew exactly what he was getting when he got you. He's not surprised. He didn't get the raw end of the deal. He didn't buy a lemon that he'd like to take the lemon law act and put into effect. He wasn't hoodwinked. Nobody pulled the wool over his eyes. He knew every time I am going to fail him. He, knew, he knows every time I make my promise, I'll never do that again. I'm so sorry. And then, oh, I did it again. He knew that. He's not surprised. But he still said, here is the promise. Here is the hope. Here is the anchor I am setting. And not one time does it say, if you're good. Not one time does it say, if you behave yourself. Not one time does it say, this plan is dependent upon what you do. It is not. He knew everything about you. Before you were even formed, he knew all about you. And he still said, here is my hope. Here is the anchor. I'm still going to provide a way for you. I'm still going to put Jesus in the holy of holies. He's going to go behind the curtain. He's not only going to go behind the curtain, he's going to rip the curtain from top to bottom. And you will now be able to go in regardless of the state you're in. We constantly battle not being good enough. I don't care how long you've served in this, you will still battle. I've not been good enough. I did it again. I have failed again. How in the world, God, do you want anything to do with me? But nowhere do I see that his plan is dependent upon you or me. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. Because we're told all our lives, you got to be good enough. You got to be good enough. You got to be good enough. You might get a promotion if you're good enough. You might get a merit raise if you're good enough. You might do this if you're good enough. And we live our life like that in Christ that we're not good enough when it has nothing, nothing to do with the plan of God. Nothing to do with the plan of God. His love is something that this plan of his, this hope, this anchor is all about his love for us. Not our love for him. That's not even part of the equation. We're the ones who bring that in. We drag it in with us. I did this and I did that. Our love, human love, is so dependent upon what you do to me. You're good to me, I'll be good to you. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. It's conditional. You hurt me, I'm, I'm going to hurt you right back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of bad about that. I'm kind of a vengeful person. <laughs> no, nothing from the front row, please. <laughs> He's not allowed to make any facial expressions or go, amen. We settled that a long time ago. He's not allowed to do that. He's a saint. <laughs> Puts up with me. We're conditioned to that when it had, plays no part in anything. But we, we are so conditioned, that, again, from a child, how we're supposed to act and behave. And then we come in here and we go, oh, I can't go to church because, man, I messed up this week. I bet Pastor Ray won't even let me in the door. He won't even shake my hand. If he knew what I'd done, he wouldn't even shake my hand. God's not that way. He made this promise. He made this hope regardless of you. And it is set there not as, well, I wish this was true. I sure hope this plan of salvation is true. I sure wish the word of God is true. I sure wish his promises. No, we have confidence. We have hope. We have assurance. We have a promise that everything he has said in here is true. And you can depend on it regardless of what you've done. Regardless of what you did this week or last month. We drag our past around behind us. We are so attached to our past. You know why? Because people judge us on our past. Well, I remember when you, well, you know what? That was the old me. This is a new me. 
That's not, that's not me anymore. But a lot of times it's, they see it because we're dragging it along behind us. We can't let go of it. We've got we've to stand on this promise, this hope, that when he says it's gone, it's gone. You don't have to carry it around with you any longer. This hope that we have. When the early church was battling this, I, I hope you'll think about what the early church went through. You know, they were persecuted because Jesus was a blasphemer. How dare you say you're the son of God? See, that doesn't mean anything to us because we've that's all we've ever known. But can you imagine the early church, what they faced because they dared to believe something besides the old law? why they were in hiding, why they crucified him, because he dared to go against the religious order of the day. And the people who stood and believed, wow, they, they really had some strong faith. They really went and, and stood with this and stood firm. When it would have been much easier to go with, you know what, I think we've made a terrible mistake here. They saw people dying. They saw Christians being martyred. We don't see that today. And so the early church needed some reassurance that you're headed the right direction. It's okay. I've got this. This is my plan. It's okay. It's good to go. So as you move forward, whatever it is that's in your stumbling block and you're going, well, I don't know about this. Have you ever thought, I hope this is real. Have you ever thought that? I have. I have went, well, you know, God, I hope, I hope this is real because, <laughs> you know, I'm staking my life on it here. I hope it's real. He always assures me it is. That, those thoughts don't last very long, but I, I'm not sure we're being very honest if we've said we've never thought, well, you know, really? Would I die for you, Lord? If somebody put a gun to my head and said, renounce Christ or die, I, would I? Do I believe it that much, God? I do. And he'll give me the strength if that day ever comes. But these are the same thoughts they were having. You know, they, they were expecting a revolution. They were expecting a government overthrow. They were expecting something big to happen, and when their life, something big did happen, but they didn't see it always in that way. They were like, have we made the right choice here? So when you begin to doubt, have I made the right choice here? Have, is this really what God's got for me? Is this really the plan? Is this, can this really be trusted, all of it? I mean, every word of it, can it really? Know this. Go back and read Hebrews 6, 19, and 20. We have a sure hope. And it is anchored. It's not going to be drifted away. It's not going to crash against the rocks. It's going to hold firm. It's going to hold tight. He has got this all under control. Nothing is going to change this plan. And we've been talking about this a lot as I think about past things that have been said. There is no natural disaster that's going to change this anchor. There's no new atheist movement that's going to remove this anchor that holds this sure hope. Your disbelief or rebellion will not change the fact that this anchor holds. You turning on God and running away is not going to change God's plan one, one degree. Hurricanes, tornadoes, not going to change it. Witchcraft's not going to change it. Drugs aren't going to change it. No matter what this world throws at us, it is not going to change the fact that the anchor is holding this faith that we have, this hope of a new life, this hope of salvation, this hope of promise, this hope of answered prayer, and not hope as in wishful thinking, hope as in trust, hope as confidence, hope as positive proof that it's real, that it's true. So whatever you face, whatever you're going through, I encourage you to think about this isn't dependent on you. Because if it was, whew, I'd have been a goner a long time ago, long time ago. But the, but the anchor holds because it's his plan. It has nothing to do with you. Pastor Tony, do we have that? Oh, awesome. He's, Pastor Tony's going to play a song, and I'm just going to ask that you listen to it. And you think about your life and what it holds. And after the song, I'll ask the, the praise team to come and, and uh, the prayer partners Go ahead, Brother Tony. Thank you for all you do up there, too, guys. You're, you're awesome. I had journeyed Through the long, dark night Out on I 
In spite of yourself.
I'm going to ask you if you need to set your anchor, if your ship's kind of tossing around, or maybe you're not sure that you can really believe this or trust this. Maybe somebody's put doubt in your mind. Maybe somebody's told you it's not real. Maybe somebody's you know, giving you scientific proof that God doesn't exist or whatever. You need to reset your anchor. I'm going to ask that you come up here. If you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, I ask now's a great time to do it. Just come up here. Somebody will help pray with you. They're not your answer. They won't be your salvation. <laughs> They'll just help you get there. I don't ever want to give the impression that folks up here were human. We don't have all the answers, but we, we know the person who does. I'm just going to ask that you come forward if you need prayer, if you need to set your anchor, if you need to retrust in this plan that he's got. It's not about you. Come lay yourself up here and then leave it here. I ask this in Jesus' name.
Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word today, Father God. Lord, that the anchor holds, Lord God. We have a we have a promise, Lord God. And Lord, if there's one thing that you can't do, Lord God, and that is you cannot lie. Lord, the anchor holds. We thank you, Lord God, that our hope is in you. Lord, that our hope is in a promise, Lord God, that you made, Lord, that that holds, Father God. Lord, we thank you this morning, Father God. We are encouraged, Father God. Lord, to fight another day, Lord God. Lord, to take another step, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you, Father God. Lord, that we'll not, we'll not cower down, Lord God. We'll not sit down, Lord, in this late hour, but we will lift our heads, Father God. We will look up, Lord God, because our redemption draweth nigh. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for healing in our bodies, healing in our lives, healing in our relationships. Father God, we just want to praise you today, Father God, Lord, for this special day to come together as a body of believers, Father God, lifting up our voices, lifting up our hands, lifting up our faith to you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord, that reach down for us, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving us, for redeeming us, for paying the price, Lord God. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you a praise this morning, Father. We thank you, Lord God. Lord, you've taken us through some, some really hard times in this life, Lord God. But the anchor holds, Father. Lord, we thank you, Father God. And we shout the victory this morning. Victory in our lives. Victory in our families. Victory in the camp, Lord God. Victory in the church, Father God. Hallelujah. Lord, we cry victory, Father. Lord, we have victory in Jesus. Lord, we give you a praise in the name of Jesus and everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, glory, glory. Hallelujah.